Hello and welcome to worship for September 6, 2020. Let's open with a word of prayer. In this place and at this time, we come to you, O oh God. We come seeking your presence. We come seeking your word. We thank you for the ways that you have shown up in our lives this week. The times when we saw your presence at work and the times when we were blind to you. Holy God, as we join together in worship, help us to feel your presence. Open our hearts, unstop our ears, that we may hear you speaking. Encourage us in our inmost hearts to follow you, in times easy and in times hard. We live, O oh God, in your grace. Be with us, Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Listen for God's word. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take two, one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So it happened that I needed to have a hard conversation with a friend. I had said something without thinking. I would really stepped in it this time. I couldn't sleep that night because I knew the conversation that I needed to have the next day. And so finally the dawn came and it got late enough in the day when I could actually make the phone call. And I called and I spoke with my friend and I apologized for my thoughtless remark. We talked about why I might have said it, what it meant, and how I would seek to not speak without thinking again. We did all that and the friendship was repaired. In fact, it was different than it had been before. The next time I slipped up and said something out of turn, I got called on it. Because of the relationship we had had of admitting mistakes and being vulnerable to being called out when either one of us stepped out of line, the relationship was stronger. But it doesn't always work out that way. We probably all have relationships broken from our past. A thoughtless word or an action breaks down the trust. Whether we are in a type of relationship, no matter what, with another human being or with a group of human beings, there will at some time or another be conflict. We can call it something nicer. We can call it a, a difference of opinion or just not being on the same page. But no matter how you dress it up, conflict, conflict exists in every single human relationship at some time or another. And this is no less true for congregations. I remember visiting a congregation uh, many years ago and they were divided still over an issue that had happened 10 years ago. And in their sanctuary, they had people sat on different sides of the main aisle, depending on where they fell in that argument 10 years prior. The congregation that that we are in now, St. Andrews, has had conflict over the years as well because conflict is a part of communal life. We cannot eliminate conflict without eliminating community. Conflict is not a bad thing in and of itself. I don't think that Jesus laid out this res uh, reconciliation process because he thought it would eliminate conflict in believing communities. I think he included it because he knew conflict would happen wherever two or three were gathered in his name. And they were going to have to find a way to deal with it. Now reading the text, there are some important things that this text does not say. This text does not say that anyone should place themselves in danger 
to seek reconciliation with another person who could harm them, physically or emotionally. Nor does this pattern of reconciliation seek to keep people in communal relationships with others who are abusive or who are trying to manipulate the reconciliation process to their advantage. So then what does this process say and why does it matter today? This process seeks to bring people together before getting more people involved. We've all seen it happen. Two people have a disagreement and rather than seeking to work it out between the two of them, they begin to line up supporters for their side of the argument. And this can easily escalate as that disagreement between the two original people doesn't seem to matter anymore. I've even seen times when conflict has begun between two people and they become reconciled, but the two sides that they had gained uh, for their supporters, the conflict between them continues. Jesus set forth this process, hopefully, to seek reconciliation between people of faith before there were posses and extra people involved in the conflict. The goal of this process is the restoration of the community. It's about bringing people back together. And it's a great idea, but is it for real? Could it really work? If conflict, if the conflict at, at play is about arguing over the color of the new carpet for the sanctuary, no, I do not think this is the model for conflict resolution. Nor is it intended to resolve this type of conflict. This is intended to resolve conflicts of sin in a faithful community. So let's remember the, sin, the definition of sin as this. Brokenness in relationship. Brokenness in relationship between the people and God and between the people of God with one another. So it's not the argument over the carpet color that is at play here. But if the argument over the carpet color leads to a brokenness in the relationship between God's people, then yes, that is what's being addressed here. So when we look at it this way, it's not really about conflict management. It's about discipleship, about our walk with God. When we are in conflict with others in our community, our ability to be faithful followers of Christ is impaired. If we are unable to worship with one another because there is some conflict, then our conflict is affecting our discipleship. If all of these efforts at reconciliation do not lead to restoration of community, Jesus tells his disciples that they are to treat the others as Gentiles and tax collectors. Now, if Jesus were just a regular Jewish person in the first century, this command to treat somebody as a Gentile and a tax collector would have been to simply write them off completely, ignore them, deride them, avoid them. But this is Jesus. So Jesus, this is the Jesus who walked up to Levi or Matthew in some gospels, sitting in his tax collecting booth and invites him to follow. This is the Jesus who praised the faith of, Roman, of a Roman commander and other outsiders. So when Jesus says that we're to treat someone who is no longer part of the community as a Gentile or a tax collector, he's saying that we are to continue to invite them to faith. We are to continue to seek their reconciliation into the community, to continue to seek restoration of relationship. In this way, Jesus leaves the door open for the hope of restoration. It may not happen, but we are not to shut the door completely. Again, on a note that must be added here is that this is not about leaving ourselves open to abuse or constant antagonism because Jesus wouldn't support that. But after laying out these series of steps, Jesus offers us the sense of hope for reconciliation. And then he adds this reminder, I tr truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is his way of reminding his disciples of the tremendous responsibility they have to God, to one another, and to the earth as a whole. 
because Jesus brought up this whole loosing and binding on earth as in heaven when Peter confessed Jesus as the as um, his identity as the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. It was when Jesus praised Peter and gave him the keys of the kingdom, and it's a reminder that what we do matters. The conflicts we have matter. The relationships that we have, both whole and broken, matter. They matter beyond our own pool of immediacy. Jesus cares about the enduring health of the community, in particular, in this case, the community of his followers. He knows that this community will be sorely tested when one within a, in it betrays him, one denies him and the rest all desert him in his time of need. So the need for reconciliation and reunification will be needed all too soon to these first listeners of Jesus' words. So I pray that you may seek, rec seek to be reconciled to one another. May you seek the way of Christ. And don't worry, there are no immediate plans to change the color of the carpet in the sanctuary. May God be with you. Amen.